between Beowulf and Arthur here. Moreover, the roots of Beowulf may lie as deep as the Arthurian tale of the Holy Grail, also possibly linked to ancient cults. It's been suggested by John Grimsby and other researchers that Grendel and his mother may have been a reinterpretation of a fertility cult that preceded not only Christianity, but the ancient gods of Nordic mythology. These Viking gods, Wotan and Thor amongst others, are still commemorated by our days of the week, Wednesday and Thursday. Prior to them, even more ancient divinities named the Vanyar were worshipped. These were essentially fertility cult gods of a religion celebrating winter's end and the coming of spring. Most fertility cults involved human sacrifice to symbolize the death of winter, believing it necessary to renew the harvest cycle. It appears the human victim represented the mysterious god of fertility, who died as the world died in winter in order to be reborn. To Christianity, such practices were abhorrent and damnable, and gods of old religions considered demons. Thus, Grendel is traced back to Cain and brought into biblical reference whereby the monster and his mother are seen as gods in their winter manifestation who must be slaughtered for the world to begin its renewal. It is pointed out that many secret rituals took place by the side of lakes wherein female fertility goddesses were believed to dwell as did Grendel's mother, and where sacrifice would have made their waters equally bloodstained. The passing away of this religion into folk memory may have been catalyst for Beowulf's epic creation. Within the poem itself, there may be another shift of religious allegiance which may account for the formation of some of its narrative. I'm referring to particularly the way Beowulf defeats Grendel and his mother in their submarine lair. Uh, there is an argument that it represents a shift uh, from the much more ancient uh, fertility-based cult where a great goddess resided in a sacred lake. We have a detailed account of this and the Eng English participation in it in the Roman historian Tacitus, his Germania chapter 40. Much of the poem relates to a warrior race with keen appreciation of weaponry and armour. Only those skilled in the use of sword, axe, spear and bow would survive battle or the personal combats by which great honour could be gained. Sutton Hoo's helmet was obviously not intended for war, but display, although Beowulf is said to have worn a helmet made of beaten gold embellished with boar shapes. In reality, any warrior's head would have been protected by a round iron helmet furnished with nasal and eyepiece, his face and neck protected by hinged metal straps. A decorated boar design represented the wearer's fierceness and courage, for this was an animal whose charge could run a spear shaft through the length of its body and still be capable of rending and tearing the hunter who held it. Warriors who had gained wealth through combat or gifts would have worn valuable mail coats made by northern smiths renowned for their metalworking. Beowulf's epic poem makes clear that coats of mail armour were so valuable as to be handed down from father to son, while well, that buried at Sutton Hoo indicates the honour bestowed on this particular warrior. A round wooden shield was also carried, its bearer's personal choice of decoration foretelling later heraldic devices that identified in battle. Beowulf's world traded widely, and he and his followers would have known and employed objects from as far afield as the Middle East and even India. Christian objects and materials would also circulate amongst this pagan society. Booty gained by shipborne warriors who had raided and looted defenceless religious sites and monastic settlements. Even so, this Germanic society seems to have possessed an innate grimness. In far gentler and sunnier Mediterranean lands, Roman and Greek could believe heaven to be a place of golden fields in whose sunlit glades nymphs and satyrs might frolic. But the landscape of darker northern territories was one where human attack or accident might readily be interpreted as the actions of evil creatures always ready to rend or destroy. 
Seamus Heaney's outstanding Beowulf translation reveals the influence of such dark beliefs. Sometimes at pagan shrines they vowed, offerings to idols, swore oaths, that the killer of souls might come to their aid and save the people. That was their way, their heathenish hope. Deep in their hearts they remembered hell. Once again, the poet remembers cults older than Christianity, for it was not the Christian devil these people were worshipping, but fertility gods a Christian church had demonized. Other fascinating insights into Germanic society are provided by this poem. Beowulf is portrayed as an honorable warrior who, although brave and fierce in battle, never took advantage of another's drunkenness and could always hold his temper in check. The fact it seemed necessary to record this in such a work suggests it was an unusual warrior characteristic, and thus Beowulf's poem might be considered as much a code of social and military behavior than a record of one man's courageous deeds. There is evidence from this and other early societies that drink, and perhaps even some form of drugs, were taken before battle to inspire what now appears superhuman courage and strength. At the Battle of Stamford Bridge in 1066, a Norse berserker, red-bearded and mighty of limb, probably in a drug-induced frenzy, alone held the River Derwent's bridge against the whole of an Anglo-Saxon army and all but changed the course of history. Drug-taking has also been traced back to early religious practices, whereby it was believed that drug-induced ecstasies were manifestations of possession by deity. This could also take an animal form, including that of a boar or a wolf, particularly admired for their courage and ferocity. So at what period did pagan and Christian practice blend together as displayed by the Beowulf narrative? Whoever was the actual poet, his knowledge of pagan beliefs and practices is intriguing, since any educated person of that period was almost certainly Christian. It is possible that his personal faith was inextricably intertwined with pre-Christian pagan beliefs. And in this he may have resembled Redwald, king of the Wuffings in East Anglia, greatest of the kings buried at Sutton Hoo. Indeed, there are those who believe that the work would have been composed not long after the time of the ship burial. Given that the Wuffings shared a common culture with the Yats, East Anglia has a strong claim to be the cradle of this astonishing epic. It is certainly very likely that when looking for an inspirational subject, the poet would look to those with a strong affinity to the ancestors of his race. <laughs> 